Good morning. It's good to see you today. Let me say welcome to those of you who are watching online, to our friends over at the prison and our friends at the jail, and to those of you who are here in the room. We are in a series right now called Behind Enemy Lines, and we're doing a slow walk through the book of Daniel. Daniel's a little bit of a heavy book. I don't know if you've noticed this. We've got three more weeks in it. Next week's a little lighter. I hope that you come back. We're going to do a a whole service focused on worship. We're going to do some extra singing as we uh, reflect on Daniel's worship and what that meant for him in his faith. Um, so yeah, this book about the Jews being carried away to Babylon, more specifically the people of Judah, being carried away behind them in the enemy lines in Babylon. Last week we talked about Daniel chapter 3. That was the story of the fiery furnace and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's incredible faithfulness to do what God had called them to do, even in terrible circumstances. Uh, then you get J Daniel chapter 4. We're not going to talk a lot about this. Um, what happens in Daniel chapter 4 is that Daniel interprets a dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. He, in his dream, he's going to become a beast if he does not humble himself before God, he's going to lose his mind. And sure enough, he didn't humble himself before God and he lost his mind and he went crazy until finally he humbled himself and worshiped God and he was uh, he regained his sanity. And then his son, Belshazzar, actually his uh, second son, he has another son in between these who becomes king. They don't talk about him in uh, the book of Daniel, but Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's son, sees handwriting on a wall. A spirit is writing on the wall, and Daniel is able to interpret the writing on the wall, meaning, meaning, tekel and parzin is what it says. And Daniel says, that means that you're gonna be, your kingdom is going to be overthrown and you're going to be killed. That's what it means, uh, King Belshazzar. And Belshazzar doesn't like this interpretation very much because he's in a drunken stupor, doesn't even know where he is. He's like totally plastered at this time when Daniel's talking to him. But at this exact moment, the army of the Medes and the Persians have gathered together to attack Babylon and take control. And so sure enough, that very night, Belshazzar is killed and the Medes and the Persians take control and are now in charge of the nation of Babylon. And so the, the king that takes over is a guy named Darius. So when we read Daniel chapter 5 or Daniel chapter 6, we are now in a new reign of a new king named Darius, and it is also the chapter where we read the story of the big famous story of the book of Daniel, Daniel and the lion's den. So the Medes and the Persians take over. They're now ruling. And King Darius hears about this wise man named Daniel, this magi. And he's in charge of all the other wise men. And he says, why did all these previous kings keep elevating Daniel to power? And he gets to know Daniel a little bit. And he falls in love with Daniel. Like he just thinks Daniel is the bee's knees, awesome dude, elevates him to power. Now all of a sudden Daniel is again in charge in another king's rule of Babylon. This just keeps happening over and over again. And so all the other administrators, all the other politicians are jealous. They're like, who's this Jewish Babylonian that you're going to put in charge of us? Like we've been loyal to you. We're, we're your where are your dudes? What do you mean, Daniel? Who's this guy? So they get all jealous and angry at Daniel, and they start plotting. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs. But they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, may it be said of us, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded, our only chance of finding grounds for, for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. You ever notice how annoying it is when some outsider comes in and starts telling you how to do stuff? Like every once in a while, the, here at New Life, we'll hire a consultant to come in and tell us some things that we need to change. And we're like, get, get out. You don't know. We're cowboys. We got this under control. Don't, we don't want some outsider coming in here and telling us how to do things. What if somebody came into our church, a Hasidic Jew, and he starts telling us that we need to start changing some beliefs. You're going to have to stop eating pork. You're going to have to give up the cheeseburgers. Quit cutting your hair. Let your beards grow out on the sides. And get circumcised. You look at this dude and you'd be like, Excuse me? 
Now, I don't know if you see this picture that is on the screen right now. I had not seen this until last service. But Grant did some Photoshopping and made my beard look much better. Apparently, you got to cut it like that. That's how you do it if you want to be. You can't trust any picture you ever look at, by the way. Like, there's Photoshoppers even better than Grant. So this... Hasidic Jew comes in and says, you got to start living this way and, and doing this, this, your life this way. And everybody's like, no thanks, Daniel. We're good. We don't need your input. We've got this all figured out. Daniel's like, are you sure? Because there's only one way to eternal life and you got to be adopted into God's family. You, you've got to be a child of God. And so if you got to do things like we do things. And this just ticks off the Babylonians. They just can't stand it. But if you think about it, isn't this kind of what we do? Christians, we say, have faith in Jesus and you can live forever. Have faith in Jesus and you can go to heaven. You can be a child of God. You can, Jesus will make your life better and he'll make you better at life. Hey, you should come to Jesus. This is why we say it. We say, Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. These, these, the thes are very important in this passage. No one can come to the father except through me. There is only one right way. There is only one truth. The only way is a relationship with Jesus. Believe in him and you will be saved. Believe in anything else or anyone else and you will not be saved. It's the only way. In other words, Christianity is exclusive. One way. It's not my truth versus your truth. It's not my opinion versus your truth or your opinion. It, it, there is no mine and yours. It is the one way, one truth, pick it or be wrong. Now, you can try to get to heaven by being good. This is what most of the world does. You, are you going to heaven? Well, I try to be a good person. Well, you failed. You failed the test because that's not the way. The only way is Jesus. The only way is a relationship with him. You couldn't be good enough. So the one who was good enough came to earth and he died to make you good enough. The only way for you to be holy is to be made holy by the only one who is holy. To be washed clean. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what your background is or what you look like, you need the blood of Jesus to wash your sins away and make you holy. So Christianity is the only way. Any other way will fail. It's the only way. But, so Christianity is exclusive, but it's also inclusive. There is a huge difference between claiming that Christianity is exclusive and excluding people from Christianity. Everyone is welcome. There's only one way, but you are invited to walk that way with us. Come as you are. Just as you are. At New Life, we even say, belong before you believe. Start walking with us. There is a path. It's the right path, but you're welcome to join us. It, this isn't good enough for people, though. In our world, we're not okay with you having truth. We, we just like relativity. We like the my truth, your truth type things, and we can kind of just pick and choose and sprinkle in whatever we want. And I don't like that part of your faith, but I like this part, so I'll take that part and throw out this part. And we just kind of create our own beliefs, and now it's my truth. This is the, the world we live in. The reality is that the exclusivity of Christianity does not mix well with the tolerance message of the West. Tolerance. Don't tell me, you can do whatever you want, live your own life. Well, besides certain things, we don't like that. But do what you want, just don't tell me what I need to do. In other words, they are intolerant of our intolerance. They don't like it. They say there is no absolute truth, and that is absolutely true. Get over it. Well, there's, unless I say it's true, then it's true. The problem is that my truth says that they're in a burning building. And whether they believe it is true or not, they're in a burning building. And the danger is real. So I need them to know the only way out of the burning building. I know the path. I've been there. I've walked this path and I know it's the only way out. You got to walk this way. 
That's why we here at New Life believe that the come as you are message is so incredibly important. It emphasizes the inclusivity of our exclusivity. Jesus is the only way, but you are welcome to follow him. No matter who you are and what you've done, heaven is exclusive. But exclusivity does not mean, does not require exclusion. Because here's the cool God we follow. Because heaven is exclusive, Jesus left heaven. Because heaven is exclusive, Jesus left heaven to include us. While we were still sinning against him, Jesus left heaven so that we could walk the only way to heaven. Daniel was inviting people to follow God, but they didn't want to. That's not the way I grew up. That's not what not the way thought. I, that's not what my parents told me was the truth. What you're saying, there's only one God? Uh-uh, Daniel, we've elevated past that. We are, we are intellectually too smart to settle for just one God. There are many gods, Daniel. So the administrators, furious and high officers, jealous, went to the king and said, the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine, God, or human, not God, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. And now, your majesty, issue, a, issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed. An official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed the law. You think this happens today? Lobbyists convincing rulers to pass laws for their own gain. Yeah, we live in Babylon. Verse 10. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room. Breaking the law is what he's doing here. When it, with his windows open toward Jerusalem. So Daniel's protesting. He, he's protesting quietly, but he's not pro- hiding his protest. I think there's some cool details in this verse that just tell us Daniel's posture toward breaking this law. He's not organizing a riot. He's not looting the castle. He is living counterculturally. He's breaking the law, but he's doing it peacefully. He's not just going with the flow and doing what everybody else does. Okay, made a new law, I'll just follow it. He's saying that law goes against what I believe, so I cannot follow it. I think in our world, we're called to do something similar because we don't live actually in Babylon. We say we live in Babylon, but our, the evils of our nation do not even come close to comparing to the evils of Babylon in which they're killing advisors, can't tell them what their dreams are or castrating captives from another land or whatever. Like we don't live in the evils of Babylon, but there are evils that go on in our society, right? And Daniel says, I'm going to take a stand against this evil. Well, we've been called to do something similar. How, how do we do this? Well, I have some ideas. So here at New Life, we have this uh, purchase project out in the shop. We're doing that kind of as a little bit of a, a protest against the way things are done. It, just a little bit of a way to say, hey, all that Asian and African forced labor stuff, yeah, we're not okay with that. Uh, all the slavery that's going on be, to, in order to produce the clothes that we wear on a regular basis, we just don't think that's okay. So we're going to start buying some things from people who we know who made it, where they got their resources. We're going to make sure that they're paid a fair amount. And we're going to just, in a little silent protest, spend our money differently. Or maybe we cho- choose uh, to make a covenant with our eyes in which we say, you know what, I'm going to choose the, the media that I consume a little more cautiously. Do you realize that every time you look at pornography, you are supporting a terribly violent, harmful world that is doing damage beyond what we can even see. You are adding to the slavery, the sex slave trade, and all these other evils that are going on behind the scenes that we're supporting without even knowing it. We're going to say, you know what? Not anymore. 
I'm not okay with this. I'm going a different way. Decide you are not going to bow down to this world's idols. What about Sabbath? Everyone else in the world is living this hurried, busy, crazy life, trying to make sure that we're in every activity and our kid plays every sport. And they've, they, they, I don't know what opportunity we think we're going to miss out on. And we just say, you know what? No. We're going to say no to mindless busyness so that we can say yes to things that are more important. And we're going to rest. And we're going to worship. We're going to say that for every seven days, one of them we're going to spend just focusing on God and resting, taking a break. What about the details in verse 10? It says he's in his upstairs room protesting, but his windows are open, so he's not hiding. And what are they open toward? They're open toward Jerusalem. Anybody know what's going on in Jerusalem right now in history? Jerusalem has been destroyed. It is in ruins. Daniel's home is in ruins and his window is open toward Jerusalem in a sign of faith. He believed the promise of of Jeremiah that God gave to Jeremiah that God would rebuild Jerusalem, restore Jerusalem. So as he's praying, he's remembering this. In fact, he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done giving thanks to his God, giving thanks. Wait, what, what are you giving thanks for, Daniel? Isn't it obvious that God has abandoned you? Daniel, you, you were kidnapped from Jerusalem and then they dr- destroyed your home. They dragged you off to a foreign land. They castrated you and turned you into a eunuch. They attempted to brainwash you and take away everything that you care about. And now you're a slave and you're giving thanks? Not too smart, Daniel. I think often many times in our lives we have Jerusalems. Parts of our life, areas that are, of our life that are just in shambles. We just kind of ignore them, you know? Maybe I use some drug or alcohol or habit or eating or busyness or something to kind of forget. I can't deal with the pain of what's going on over there, so I'm just going to block out that memory. I'm going to pretend like it's not even there. I'm just going to choose not to face it and move on with my life. I got enough to deal with in Babylon. I don't have time to think about Jerusalem, right? When Darcy and I moved to Gillette, we started working here at New Life, and things were going, uh, well, they didn't go too great at the very beginning, but then things started going really well here, and, and ministry was going well, and it was the first time I'd ever been a part of a ministry that was really succeeding and doing some good things, and so this was really taking a lot of our attention, but Darcy and I at the same time were struggling with infertility, and we believed that God had called us to be parents, to raise a family, and And so we kind of had these two different things. In this area, we were kind of really fully given ourselves. But then there was this other area of our lives that we're just not happy with, not satisfied with, not okay with the fact that we couldn't have kids. And so we were kind of privately sneaking off to Seattle every once in a while to go see this fertility doctor and try to figure out why we couldn't have kids. And everybody's like, man, you guys really like vacation in Seattle. We're like, yeah, it's a vacation. That's why we're going to Seattle. And so we're going and we're trying to figure all this out. And the whole time we're doing ministry here, we've also got a window open toward another mission, something else that we believe God has called us to. And just as God was faithful to rebuild Jerusalem, God was faithful to us. Now we have two sons and we say, thank you, Lord. And I mean, we stop doing this mission. It just means that there are some times in our life when we recognize that God has a promise in the horizon. We've got something we're dealing with now and we've got something we've got to work on now, but there's something else coming. And this is what Daniel's doing in this moment. He is giving himself to his mission and Babylon while also remembering, but there is a calling coming in Jerusalem. This is similar to the story of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I don't know if you've heard the story of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. It's way bigger than what I can tell you today, but it's an incredible story. I just read a whole biography about him and just mind-boggling story. But Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor in the time of Hitler. 
And when everybody else is bowing down to Hitler, he took a stand. One day he was on a radio broadcast and he called Hitler a political idol. And specifically, he calls out to Christians and he says, Christians, you cannot bow down to this political idol. You guys have elevated him to a status that only God should have. This is not healthy. This is not okay. Hitler, I know he's a great talker and he's really good looking and he's got some cool ideas and all this stuff. But at some point, if you bow down to him, I just don't think it's going to have good ramifications. And he said this in a time long before Hitler was who we think of when we think of Hitler. It's just not a good idea. Remember that God is sitting on your throne, on the throne of your life, not Hitler. Long story, a long life later, Bonhoeffer goes through a different story than Daniel. Daniel's story, you know the end of it. It's got a good ending. Bonhoeffer's not so much. Eventually, because he would not bow down to Hitler, he was put into a concentration camp, lived a horribly terrible life in that country concentration camp until finally they decide to kill him. And in this concentration camp, they take him to the gallows. And one account of the story says that they hung him. But just before he died, they let him down. They let him catch his breath. And they hung him again. Watched him suffer. If you're not going to bow down to our idols, you don't deserve to live. They tortured him. And over and over and over again, they hung him and let him down until finally his body gave out and he died. See, there are some people who go into the lion's den and don't come out. In fact, that's the case with 11 of Jesus' 12 disciples. Faith in God is a heavy burden to carry unless... You listen to the people who say what Bonhoeffer was like when all this was happening. Unless you listen to the people who say that somehow he had peace and he had hope through the midst of all of it. Unless you expect and you know that the God of the universe is not just going to command you to go to your death before him, but also that he will be there with you. That he will give you hope that's not explainable. That Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could not have gone into the fiery furnace in their own strength but God gave them peace that they could not have otherwise had. That Daniel being faced with the lion's den would not in his own strength have had the power to go to the lion's den. But God was with him. And God gave him what he needed when he needed it. Jesus says that if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it if you acted like they act, if you do the things that they do, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world, so it hates you. I chose you to be a part of my eternal plan, not just obscure, meaningless world stuff that's going to all pass away. We are called to be different, to be countercultural, to take a stand when necessary. So are we? Are we doing the same things that everybody else is doing? Or are we taking a stand when Hitler becomes too powerful? We don't even tell people at work, I'm a Christian. How am I going to stand up against Hitler? I believe that God will give us what we need when we need it. And I think it's time for a little bit of humble disagreement. This is what Daniel did. We don't have to organize some uprising. We don't have to riot and loot. and We just got to live differently. We just got to say, hey, we believe that Jesus makes our lives better and makes us better at life, so we're going to do what he says. And Daniel disobeyed the law. So he didn't like it. King Darius is, is not a big fan of the idea of throwing Daniel in. He's actually likes Daniel a lot, but he makes the law. He's got to go along with it. And King Darius throws Daniel to the lions. We actually see evidence in history of this event, this type of thing happening pretty regularly. There are ancient stories from this time in history where kings would capture lions and then they would release them for various purposes. Usually it was for sport, 
They would capture a lion, they would release it, and they would go hunt the lion and show how great they are. Other times, they would release these lions in battle to attack their enemies. Sometimes they would do it in arena to, to fight, fight gladiators, to fight against slaves for entertainment. And sometimes they would do it to punish their captives. And if that sounds terrifying, it is. And this is what Daniel faced. He's in the lion's den. Darius can't sleep that night. Very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish. Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you served so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, long live the king. My God sent his angels to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me. For I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. How is Daniel able to talk to the king with respect after this king has tried to kill him? It's because he knew his calling. He knew that it was greater than some political battle and it was greater than some law. He knew that he had a greater eternal calling. So he respected his authority, even when his authority was evil, because he knew the bigger picture. That's us in America today. We are commanded to obey the leaders that God has put over us, to obey the government, even when we disagree with them. This is what Paul tells us. Every government authority was put there by God. So even when what they're telling us to do may be unwise. Even when they tell us what to do would cost us money. Even when they make a law that would make us have to work harder. Even when they make a law that will remove some of our freedoms. Unless they are telling us to do something that is unbiblical, we say, okay, God has placed you there and I'll obey. Unless you're trying to make yourself God and keep me from worshiping my God. Peter tells us to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. And this is Daniel. Why do I have hope? I have hope because God saved me. Peter knew that we would be tempted to argue with people that Christians would tempt, be tempted to sound more like politicians and debaters and less like friends or doctors who see sick people. Peter says, keep a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. And this is what happened when Daniel and his enemies could not find anything wrong with him. If you are going to be exclusive, if you are going to say that your way is the only way, if you are going to say that Jesus makes our lives better and makes us better at life, then he should. Then we have to live above reproach. It doesn't mean being perfect. It means being honest about our weaknesses. It means being honest about the life we're living and actually living the life we say we're living. Would you hire a fat trainer? Nope. Why? We expect some authenticity. Doesn't mean I don't want to hire a trainer who's never eaten any ice cream. I just want one who's living the life that he's telling me I should live. We want some authenticity. And this is what I think our world is asking for from Christians. Now, sometimes they're a little bit, little bit hypocritical in their expectations. But this is what I think we're called to as well. You know, we live in the Google generation. That means all the millennials are sitting back fact-checking checking everything I say. They're like, oh, I don't know if that's right. Let me Google and see if... And if I'm found out to be lying, or if, I, or if it's found out that I didn't do my research and I'm claiming confidence about something that I'm not, then I lose credibility. That impacts my witness. That makes it harder for me to be a representative of Christ. So I've got to, to some extent, live above reproach. 
Can you imagine being Daniel? He's, he's been in the service of the king for decades now. Like he's an old man by this point. And these politicians are scouring all documents, all the things that Daniel has done to try to find anything that they can hold against him and they can't find it. Can you imagine? Like what kind of life did you live? Were you a hermit? Nothing? They couldn't find anything? And that's the life that Daniel lived. May it be true of us. I'm not going to be perfect. I screw up all the time. But I'm going to be honest about it. I'm going to be transparent about it. And when we do this, when we are able to find this kind of honesty in the way we live our lives, then our ministry will prosper. Our impact will grow. And this is what kept happening with Daniel over and over again. As he was faithful to his calling, as he was faithful to the mission that he was teaching, Daniel prospered. So again, under this king, Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius. And then we're going to talk about next week, the next king. And then under the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. Isn't this what we want to be said of us? That we were so faithful to God that we lived out what we preached and that God was with us through it all? So much so that our influence in this world grows. Well, this is what I see all around this church. As people who've decided, I'm not going to just say I'm a Christian, I'm going to be a Christian. I'm not just going to say I have the hope, I'm going to live according to the hope. I'm going to live it out. I'm going to stay faithful. God, I thank you for the gift of grace that makes it possible for us to walk in your truth. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would wash us clean, that you would give us fresh starts, that you would renew our minds and make us more like you. God, if there's anybody here today who is experiencing any feelings of guilt or shame, that you would replace those feelings with love and grace and peace. That all of us, instead of looking to ourselves for justification, look to you. Instead of looking to our goodness for reason for hope, look to your goodness as reasons for peace. God, we thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen.